you suffer from the debilitating symptoms of chronic pain, swelling, and loss of joint motion due to arthritis? Are you taking drugs like Celebrex and Vioxx or other super aspirin prescriptions? If you are, you're increasing the risk of heart attack and stroke by up to 50%. This is Dr. Tom Rosell, host of Dr. Tom Rosell Live Sundays at 12 noon. Why live with pain or the dangerous side effects of drugs when the doctors at the Rosell Center for Healing practicing 21st century integrative medicine can help you experience relief like never before? Simple, safe, chiropractic, acupuncture, and nutritional care can provide significant relief from arthritic pain in less than six weeks. More than 70% of our patients experience a return to life far beyond their expectations. Give yourself the best gift possible, freedom from arthritic pain, naturally. Call today to schedule an appointment. Call 703-698-7117 or visit online at rosellcare.com. Dr. Tom Rosell live right now on 105.9 FM and AM 630 WMAL. Hello and good morning and welcome to Dr. Tom Rosell live. I'm Dr. Stephanie Pina and I'm sitting in for Dr. Tom Rosell today and we've got some great topics to talk to you about as always. Whether you tried and applied and didn't know what you were going to do next for all those health care uh, issues and illnesses, that's what this show is about every single week. We're on here at noon, and essentially we're live here in the studio, and we want to hear from you as well. So feel free to give us a call in. Uh, the number here is 1-888-630-9625. That's 1-888-630-9625. And I am lucky because I don't have to sit in for Dr. Rizal by myself. I actually have with us uh, one of the other practitioners that's at the Rizal Center for Healing, and that is Dr. Harlan Browning. Good morning. Hey, how are you doing? This is the first time we've done this together. We have. I didn't know what she sounded like on the radio, so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, it'll, it'll be fun. <laughs> so he's in, in here with me because basically he's got a great upcoming lecture that's part of our in-house educational series. Um, it's going to be this Wednesday night. April 17th at 7.30 p.m. Um, if you're interested in doing that, you can always call up our office at 603-698-7117 uh, and tell you them you want to reserve a spot for common, co- common causes of arm and hand pain. So we're going to do this in honor of spring and everything that's going on? Yeah, I, you know, when we, we look forward to to the, the presentations we're going to do. I kind of try to design them around the time of year. So obviously with spring being here, people are going outside, they're getting the yard cleaned up, maybe they're playing a little tennis. So uh, injury patterns are going to be pretty common, and certainly arm, shoulder, and hand stuff is going to be on the top of the list. So I think this is going to be a good one to do for a lot of the folks that might be overdoing it today. Well, it's kind of interesting because we see a lot of people that come into the clinic and it's usually, you know, work related in the office. Everything, you know, from, you know, over typing to bad positioning to neck and everything strained. And, you know, we don't think about what happens on the weekends when we become the weekend warrior and how that can affect everything else that's going on. So what what's kind of some of the typical stuff that you kind of see that comes in, um, especially during this time of year when people are outside and more active? You know, I think that probably the most common thing that we see is something we refer to as an overuse injury. That means that we're we're using our arm or our wrist repetitively over and over and over, and we take it beyond its capacity to handle that, so the tissues start to break down. And we might develop a bursitis or a tendonitis, or in some cases, we might even get a, an entrapment of a nerve uh, against a bone or between two muscles. But the end product is a person's going to develop, usually has pain. Uh, sometimes they get some numbness and tingling, and in certain situations, if the nerve is compressed, enough, we're going to develop uh, a weakness. And uh, a lot of times people don't treat those problems. So they linger and linger and linger. And as time goes by and the inflammation stays in place, we start to develop scar tissue. And uh, the end product is a person will have a chronic situation in place, which is not a good thing to, to have. Well, I know we have a lot of people that call in and then they also come into the office. And, you know, when they when they think arm and hand and shoulder, I mean, they're thinking everything from, you know, their fingers to their wrists to their elbows. Everything's all connected, just like we've done uh, other things in the past where we talked about hip and knee and, and foot pain. Now, do you see a lot of these things carry over from if it starts, if they have an issue in one area of the body, like say they're wrist, you really have to evaluate what's going on on both sides. Like, could there be finger stuff that goes along with there? Could there be an elbow or shoulder issue that develops from that? You know, that's that's actually a great question. I think the majority of, of overuse injuries that develop is, is a compensatory 
thing to something else. Meaning, if a person lacks range of motion, let's say in their shoulder, then they have to move their arm differently when they drive a car, when they work at their desk, or, or what have you. So as they move their arm differently, we're going to put more stress or more strain on other joints. For example, the elbow. So a person may have never picked up a tennis racket in their lifetime, and they develop tennis elbow, where we call it lateral epicondylitis. And it's the the the, the problem is not because the elbow is the issue. It's because the way that they're moving differently to maybe accommodate a tight shoulder that might not even be painful. So I, I think it's safe to say that a lot of folks develop uh, issues as as a you know a aside to something else that's going on. So it's, it brings up kind of an interesting question, but we actually have to think about this is the fact that you don't necessarily have to play tennis in order to get tennis elbow. You don't have to be a golfer in order to have golfer's elbow. Yeah, uh, with, without a doubt, you do not. And I would, I would honestly say that probably less than 5% of the people that get tennis elbow actually got it from playing tennis. It's more or less from doing something, you know, repetitively over a period of time and then the, the elbow f- uh, inflames and that's the diagnosis and it's a common term. So it's just, it's stuck around for a long time. Yeah. So hopefully, uh, if you're all listening out there, feel free to give us a call in. Uh, the number again is one eight 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 six three zero nine six two five, and that's Dr. Harlan Browning, who's going to be talking about common causes of uh, arm and hand pain, um, which is going to include everything above that we were talking about also later on. Uh, we're going to go to the phones real quick, and then we have Lorraine from Fairfax. How are you doing, Lorraine? Thank you so much, Dr. Pena, for taking my call. Um, my cousin is has a problem with the sinuses and. They, they get inflamed and they need to, he needs to use a neti pot and right now he's using golden seal, but he can't use it too often, uh, because if he does, it's extremely painful for the next several hours after usage. It does it, the job, but I was just wondering with your vast knowledge of, of Eastern medicine, could you possibly suggest another, uh, product, I mean, uh, you know, uh, supplement or, or that, or herb that could, be have a similar i understand golden seal has a natural antibiotic in it that helps with inflammation and and you know and that sort of thing in the sinuses can you think of anything that might be comparable sure there's a couple of good things but do you know why he's using the golden seal to begin with is it is there is he having sinus congestion sinus or? congestion is a it's a chronic problem and it causes migraines if left un, 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 untreated he has to he should but he doesn't uh, you, you know, should take care of his sinuses on a weekly basis with something, Himalayan salt or something. He was using golden seal, uh, but he just got to the, he was supposed to be using it every week, but he just, it's so painful, the aftermath of it. And he feels better 24 hours later. Yeah. It's, it's the process. Well, what's really interesting about golden seal is that, you know, a lot of the times when you get these herbs and they're over the counter too, you know, they're going to be in a tincture form. So that means they're going to be an alcohol base. So anytime you're adding... It's it a be, liquid form. He's yep. using the liquid form yep. of the bottle. It's usually going to be, uh, if if it's not added to something or diluted out, that can one irritate the sinuses and, and the tissue just as much as if he's got it diluted out too. Um, I can tell you this past week, a lot of people are having kind of these invisible allergy symptoms. That's what I call it when you can't see the pollen on the car, but everyone's sneezing and coming in and they're getting congested. So from a, I can tell you from a Chinese medicine standpoint and also from an herbal standpoint, you know, other things that he could do on a long-term basis could be something like stinging nettles, which is almost like a lower histamine, um, where it essentially can kind of help block I mean, that histamine reaction so he doesn't produce as much is as that, that mucus. Is that uh, in a liquid bottle form? He was told to take you, 15 drops of it in uh, distilled water, the golden seal. Yep, you it's can the usually... Stinging nettles in liquid form, too. And maybe maybe he's taking too much of the golden seal. Is 15 drops and in uh in you know distilled water a little too much in your opinion um it usually shouldn't be you know he could also alternate that because it's working slightly different like i said it's got more of a, a lower antibiotic antibiotic should, effect drops too much maybe she could go down to seven drops you know i'd probably maybe alternate which days he's doing it but if he was going to use something like the stinging nettles that's also in a liquid form a tincture is that, form is that called but, stinging nettles yep, like sting? yep sting like like a bee sting and nettles, uh, uticaria, uh, is the Latin name for it. And sometimes they do sell it in pill form. Sometimes they sell it in a, a tincture form. I prefer that because t- it's a little bit stronger and you just got to shake it up. It and doesn't it's have a form. bad taste. Yep, it's in liquid form. And but you many, wouldn't want to use something. And it should it be in, uh, in, uh, distilled water? 
Uh, yeah, you could use, you know, the best thing is when you're using a, a single herb by themselves, you probably don't want to go too much beyond what it's saying on the label. Oh, okay. Because that's giving you a normal dose. But two to three times a day works out well. And even doing the neti pot, he probably would want to not use it all the time because that can still flush out and irritate some of the... The, uh, what do you recommend, like maybe well golden seal every couple of weeks and stinging nettles like every couple of weeks? Or, or, um, or Well, the nettles can be used as needed. You know, if he's definitely noticing oh. some issues, he could do that. So There's great acupressure points. He could be using stinging nettles each day or every other yeah. day. Yeah, There's great acupuncture like points on each drop? side. It's like a nose drop or you use it in a neti pot? You use it, just put it in water and, and swish it down. Don't put it in. You don't want to put really any of those herbs really into the neti pot to use locally, um, because they do have an alcohol base, so it's going to dry the mucuses up too. So, what do you recommend? You don't recommend using the neti pot with either golden seal or the singing nettles. Then? Correct. Nope. You're taking that one internal and basically. How do you basically, take it without doing it through the neti pot? How do you? You're just you're just putting it in water and swallowing it like you would uh-huh. any kind of supplement. And he can do that with the golden seal too. Uh huh. Absolutely. And really, so you recommend doing just just drinking it then. Yep. And distill yeah, water. Awesome. Yep, and you can do, there's different, uh, neti pots are really cool as long as they get the right dose of salt in there to kind of help balance it out. Or that also can cause some issues as well. So I want to thank you, Lorraine, for calling in. Um, basically, we're going to take another quick question, I think, from David from Haymarket. How are you doing, David? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks for taking my call. No problem. Yeah, I, got a, I got a question about um, frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. I had a uh, shoulder injury several months ago and didn't really do much about it, but giving me problems that I was diagnosed with the uh, frozen shoulder and just started physical therapy. But we're just wondering if um, chiropractic might be helpful in uh, alleviating some of the symptoms. Hey, David, this is Dr. Brownie. A couple questions. Did, was there a sp- specific injury to your shoulder, or did you just start to develop tightness over time? No, it was a hyperextension injury, sports-related. Okay. And did you tear any ligaments? I don't believe so. I hadn't had any imaging done, but um, based on my uh, orthopedic consultation, uh, they don't think it's a, 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 a tear of any of the ligaments or the capsule, so just an adhesive capsulitis. And it had progressively been getting worse um, over the, the about six or seven months. Okay. To, to answer your question, yeah, it's, chiropractic can be extremely effective in, in frozen shoulder. So I want you to think a little bit more about the shoulder as being a whole bunch of joints as opposed to just your arm bone going up into the socket. You have ribs that attach to the vertebrae, which provide a platform for which your your scapula, your shoulder blade moves. So what often happens is when a person injures their shoulder, we get a reflexive spasticity of the muscles to protect ourselves, which is, is okay on the short term, but on the long term, it causes everything just to be pulled closer together. Um, with a frozen shoulder, that means that your arm bone, the humerus, is going to slowly move upwards into the socket. The rotator cuff, the muscles that help support it, will will also get tighter over time. But the, the one issue that I find with frozen shoulder, if it's not addressed, is you have to get better motion in the scapula itself. It, it would seem like all you need to do is just move the arm bone, but that's kind of the end the end product. It's, it's really more about the way the scapula moves and also your clavicle. The clavicle should rotate backwards as we lift our arm up, and when we develop lots of tension in the musculature, um, it doesn't take place. So if it can't rotate backwards, it's it's very difficult for to, us to, to lift our arm, you know, in a smooth manner. Well, I think okay. it's really what's really interesting too about that is a lot of times, you know, we'll go in and, and once things are kind of moving too, and making sure that the blood flow in, is getting to that area too. So even from an acupuncture standpoint, you can do points that are locally if you can find figure out which muscles might be more tight and pulling, and then also treat it distally if you're doing things like different types of therapies or they have it taped and stuff as well too to kind of give some extra support in there. You know, David, I, you know this this Wednesday night I, I will probably be touching on some frozen shoulder as well because uh, it, it's just very common. So you know, feel free to call the office and come in and. We'll you know, we'll go over a little bit deeper of what's going to be happening as far as the mechanism behind the frozen shoulder. The, the weird thing about um, getting adhesive capsulitis, it can be gone in as little as two weeks or last as long as, as two years. It's one of those conditions where we're, we're really confused as far as why it takes so long. You don't have uh, diabetes by chance, do you? No, otherwise healthy. Okay. Sometimes with people with uh, diabetes can be more more likely to get it. So, uh, you know, feel free to call the office and, and, and come in and see the presentation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the way the arm bone moves and certainly the importance of the scapula. Well, we're going to take a quick break here. Um, you can keep calling us in at the radio station. We'll be happy to take your questions. And we're talking about common causes for arm and hand pain here on the Dr. Rizal Live Show. 
We'll be back in a minute. This is Dr. Tom Rosell, author of Ageless Health, Health is a Do-It-Yourself Program. My book, now also available in audio version, is a step-by-step program of how to take control of your health and wellness without drugs or needless surgery. You have the capacity to change your health and level of well-being. Take control of your health today and order Health is a Do-It-Yourself Program. For more information and to order, please visit agelesshealthbook.com. That's agelesshealthbook.com. Educate. Engage. Empower. Take control of your health with Dr. Tom Roselle and the Roselle Center for Healing. Information is power. Achieve an ultimate state of wellness with Dr. Tom Roselle's Education Lecture Series Video On Demand. Discover how to create an extraordinary life of optimal health and wellness. Visit drtomrosellecom slash education. That's drtomrosellecom slash education. Welcome back to the Dr. Tom Rizal Live Show. This is Dr. Stephanie Pina, and I am hanging out in the uh, studio here, basically with Dr. Harlan Brownin, and we're going to be talking about different things related to arms, elbows, fingers, and wrists, and all the above. Um, Dr. Brownin, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what you what you plan on talking about on th- Wednesday night, um, April 17th, which is going to be our continuing in-house lecture that's free for everybody who wants to come. Well, if... If you've never been to one of my presentations, um, I like to go into a lot of the anatomy and, and, and the neurology behind things because I think when folks understand the way the body's laid up uh, and they understand how point A connects to point B, it really helps them see the big picture as, as far as why they might have the aches or pains that they do. So we're going to certainly talk about the way the shoulder moves and the elbows that moves. And uh, we're going to look closely at the nervous system because the nervous system it runs the show. So if we have dysfunction in the nervous system, be it uh, in the cervical spine or somewhere along that whole chain all the way down to your fingers, we're going to see changes in function. So that might be an ache or pain or that might be a weakness or a tension in a muscle. Um, the the idea is if we can figure out what the anatomy is doing, we can figure out what the problem is and, and come up with a, a conservative solution to it. So we're going to go over all that stuff. And then obviously we're going to talk about strategies to help fix the problems. And more importantly, what, what can we do to make sure it doesn't come back? Because most of the stuff that I see in my practice is, is chronic in nature. So a person will do whatever it takes till they're out of pain and then that's that's about it, and then six months later it comes back again. Well, if you are interested in what he just told you about, too, feel free to give the office a call. The number is 703-698-7117 to reserve your seat. Uh, they tend to go fast. I've sat in a couple of Dr. Browning's lectures, and when he talks about anatomy, it's very visual, and you understand what's going on with all those bones and joints and everything, which can be pretty confusing when you just kind of think of it as far as what we learned in basic anatomy class before. So he's definitely the man to come and listen to. So uh, we're going to take another call. Uh, this is going to be Gene from Columbia, and as I know it's related to what we're talking about. So how are you doing, Gene? Good. Uh, maybe I'll be better after I talk to the doctor. I know radio diagnosis is quite questionable, but I'll try to describe the discomfort I'm feeling in both arms. Um, if, right now, if I go down and, and touch the side of my arm near my elbow, when I get up towards the top, maybe three or four inches for what I consider the shoulder area, there seems to be a, a muscle that kind of sticks out. Maybe it's in most people, a muscular area up there. And when I extend my arms forward or behind me, anything below level, I'm okay, but as soon as I reach above my head and a little bit behind me to reach something, maybe when I'm at work or something, to reach something on a shelf, or if I if I confront the thing straight forward, I'm okay, but if my arms stay up there a very long time or I turn a little bit more, the arm reaching like back like you're reaching for something above the level of my shoulders, it's excruciatingly painful right in those muscle areas on each arm. Hey, Gene, Not at the same time, but just the arm you're using. Gene, you, there's, you don't have any numbness or tingling associated with this Not as well? Not at all. Okay. And it only happens... I'm 65, by the way. Okay. And it only happens basically when you move your your arm ab- above parallel to the ground, like a, like you're, as if you're reaching to get something well, off I of could, a... I have, my, I have my right arm straight out, level with my shoulder. It doesn't hurt. 
As soon as I put it up above my head, I start feeling the pain. And if I move, move it back a little bit towards the window, which is behind me, I start feeling the pain. And the pain. And if I grab anything of any any kind of weight and bring it down off the shelf, it's very painful. But the pain will go away in about a minute. So is the pain more in the front of your shoulder, or to the side, or the back part of your shoulder? Well, what do you consider your shoulder? That's the big thing. I'm calling this the upper part of my arm. Okay, the upper part is it in the front of your upper part of your arm, or to the side? To the side, in that kind of muscular area. Okay, right so that's that, that you're, there's a quite a few muscles there, but um, there's a rotator cuff muscle that's deep inside there called the supraspinatus, mm -hmm. and it has a tendency to get impinged or pinched in some folks when they reach above of the, above their head. So what you're describing sounds like an impingement syndrome, most likely this, this supraspinatus. Sometimes it can also be the bicep, which is one of the arms, uh, uh, the muscles in the front of the arm. Uh, this can be because of faulty mechanics, you just don't have good range of motion, or it certainly be, can be because there's an imbalance in the musculature. You might have too much shortness in the muscles of the front and too much weakness in the muscles of the back. Now, so, if you, flat, if you flatten your arm out, I put my finger on the inside of my inside of my arm, right opposite the elbow, and I bring it up a couple inches. Is that the bicep? Yes, that's the bicep. It's no, no, never painful there. It's when I tur uh, t uh, run my hand on the opposite side of the arm up towards more of the shoulder, but on the arm, not the shoulder, that's where it hurts. Yeah, so that, that's where the bicep gets thinner and, and, and the tendon attaches to the bone. So, yeah, it sounds like you're, you're dealing with an impingement syndrome. Again, the cause of that could be several things, but just from what you're describing, it sounds like very treatable. Obviously, you want to d take a closer look at that. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to, to come to my, my lecture or, or just give me a call at the office. Yeah, it brings up good questions, and we'll go over some more anatomy, especially in that shoulder when we get back. So we're going to break you know, for some news, and basically, but you can join us here at the Dr. Rizal show, <laughs> the show right before, uh, right after this break. And welcome back to the Dr. Tom Rizal Live Show. Uh, my name is Dr. Stephanie Pina, and I'm here with Dr. Harlan Brownin. And we're talking about everything from the shoulder to the elbow to the wrist to the fingers today and basically what you can do to help get a proper diagnosis and treatment naturally without drugs and surgery. Um, Dr. Browning, why don't we go over a little bit of why, like we had that last call on, on frozen shoulder. Why does it seem like it's so complicated in like the shoulder joint and stuff as far as diagnosing what's exactly in there because there seems like you know we think of the muscles that make up the rotator cuff and we think of the bones and some of the ligaments and tendons but there's a lot more going on in there and then everything's also affected higher up into the neck too. yeah so th just right out of the gate there's just lots of pain generators in the body meaning there's structures that can cause pain and that could be as simple as a bone to a, the obvious a nerve, but then we have ligaments and tendons, and we have muscles, and then we have this this huge network of tissue we call fascia, which will generate a lot of pain. So we see that we can develop pain from lots of different areas, and unfortunately, that can cloud the diagnosis. So let, let's let's talk for a second about something that we all heard of called carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome involves the hand, okay, but we can mimic that presentation by compressing or irritating the nerves in many, many spots al along the length of the arm and not necessarily just the wrist. In, in fact, there's, there's really nine areas of entrapment from the neck all the way down. So even though we develop pain in the hand itself, it might not be the carpal tunnel that's causing it. So very often people get a diagnosis and it's not by exclusion, it's just by convenience. In other words, the, the pains in the hand, it has to be carpal tunnel. Well, it could be because the person has a nerve getting entrapped in their neck, or it could be they have an extra rib that's causing compression of, of the nerve. It could be the same nerve, the median nerve, getting pinched between two muscles in the neck called the scalenes. It could be that nerve getting caught between your clavicle and one of the ribs, the first rib. It could be the same nerve passing underneath one of your pec muscles that's getting entrapped. It could be getting entrapped in the bicep. That's the arm, uh, the muscle in the arm. It could be getting entrapped in a muscle of the forearm called the pronator. 
or it could be getting entrapped all the way down in, in the wrist. So there's all these levels of areas that it can get pinched. So we need to step back from the symptom pattern and really make sure that we, we understand the situation before we just say the person has carpal tunnel or rotator cuff problem. Because if the person is going to investigate maybe surgery, uh, you better be right about that diagnosis or else that outcome from that surgical procedure is not going to be so good. Yeah, you hear a lot about, you know, whether it's, you know, using the different kind of stabilizations, bands and wrist brace and also, you know, either going to cortisol shots and basically surgery being kind of one of the, you know, extreme versions of that. Yeah, if you don't have that proper diagnosis and it's coming from somewhere else, some of that pain syndromes can still be occurring at the same time, correct? Yeah, it's certainly, and you certainly can cause other problems. So you bring up a really interesting point about bracing things. I'm not a huge proponent of braces unless the person obviously has fractured something or, or maybe has torn the, the muscle or the, or the ligament or the tendon to a significant point. But for the most part, bracing makes it feel better. There's no doubt about that. But what happens is, is as we brace something, we take the muscles out of their primary role, which is stabilizing a joint. So albeit we feel better, what happens is the musculature gets weaker. And its ability to function becomes different. So it, it doesn't do what it needs to. So as soon as you remove that brace, you're going to have that problem come back. Uh, and very often what happens is along the way, we're going to also propagate the situation and have other types of problems that start. So, you know, be careful with the bracing if, if unless it's really needed. I know we see a lot of people will come in and go, well, do I, you know, keep something active and keep doing it? Or if it's like a work-related injury, they're going, you know, it's not like I can stop typing and that's when I feel the pain the most. And so they're using these repetitive injuries because it may be part of, you know, their work or their job. Or, you know, I even have a lot of moms that come in. There may be new moms and stuff in there. You know, it's the way they're holding their baby or essentially the, the way they might be holding their child's hand. They're noticing that they get new sensations in their arms and in their elbows and in their wrists that they've never had before. Now, are there other different types of diseases? You mentioned, I think, diabetes is one of the other ones that tends to also affect either the bloods and the nerve supply that are going into the arms themselves, is it, or is it just like everything else? The inflammation in the body basically can, can trigger anything. Well, you know, we're, there's, there's certainly things that can mimic, um, you know, primary musculoskeletal problems um, outside of... Uh, of injuring something, if if we have a problem that slowly develops and becomes, uh, you know, progressively worse, we always want to keep our diagnostic criteria open as far as maybe it's an organic thing, especially if it's involving the shoulder. The gallbladder, very often when it is irritated or, or inflamed or maybe the person has some stones in there, will cause a referral to the, to the right shoulder blade, which you know, for, for many people, might they might think it's the rotator cuff. So uh, the, the left side of the body, the heart can refer to there. So we always want to keep those in, in our diagnostic um, criteria. And in, in some situations, we can see changes that occur because of vascular problems, rarely uh, uh, infection, but that can happen as well. So, yeah, there, there's definitely some, some other things that need to be addressed or, or looked at when you come up with a diagnosis. But I think that the way to really handle that is just to let the person talk and tell you about their health in general because if they're complaining of shoulder problems and they also talk about having some digestive issues then maybe we want to consider the gallbladder more in the in the picture and certainly as an acupuncturist you know you know the relationship as it as it carries over there well what i always thought was interesting is that when you look at the acupuncture meridians you have the large intestine and the small intestine meridians basically run on the arm all the way up through the shoulder and they have nothing, not as much really to do with digestion, but they'll sometimes they'll start to get triggered for general information in the body. So you can use some of those points to basically help open up everything from the shoulder joint all the way down to the fingers. And a lot of times when patients come in and they have carpal tunnel, you know, I'm actually looking for tender points that are on the forearm that are basically, you know, leading from their hand all the way up to their elbows to see where it's more tender. And those are sometimes some of the spots that people might be able to say massage at home to kind of also notice, is it getting tighter when they're starting to feel symptoms and stuff too. So definitely getting as much information from any patient on, on anything is a, is a good thing. 
So this Wednesday night, April 17th at 7.30 p.m. at the Rizal Center for Healing is when you're going to be able to catch Dr. Harlan Browning talking about um, the common causes of arm and hand pain. Uh, if you're interested, please call our office, 703-698-7117, to reserve your spot. Uh, spaces are limited, so we want to make sure we get everybody in there, and then you can get a good up-close look at all the models and everything that's going to bring. Learn your anatomy from the inside out. Um, also, any information on that and any upcoming um, lectures can be found on two different websites, the theroselcare.com and drdomrozell.com. And any of the previous lecture information can be found, I believe, on drrozell.com uh, as well. So when we come down to, when someone comes in, what is the first thing you evaluate when you see them come into the office and they say, you know, I've got this pain, I'm not really sure where it begins, maybe I have some tingling in my fingers, but, you know, it's one-sided versus another-sided. What's some of the main questions that, you know, someone, if they knew and they were tracking some of their own symptoms would be beneficial for you to know? Well, I, I look at historical patterns. Have they ever had this before? Uh, a lot of folks have problems that, that are on and off for long periods of time, so we we want to identify if that's the case because if there's a history to this problem as, being, as far as being around for a long period of time, we want to see maybe what, what started it. Was there an injury even 10, 15, 20 years ago that they possibly f- uh, forgot about? I always want to ask them, what have you done for the problem? Well, you know, What makes it better? What makes it worse? Um, and certainly, we, we want to formulate uh, a thorough examination to try to figure out how competent is the nervous system. Is there a, a loss of strength somewhere? Is there a loss of sensation? Does the person have normal range of motion in their joints? Very often people just don't have normal range of motion. They don't notice it because they can do their acti- activities of daily living uh, as, an, as far as what they perceive to be normal, but maybe they can't really reach up all the way. So do we see changes in range of motion? And I also look at muscle balance. That's a biggie for me. Do they have weakness in certain muscle groups and do they have too much tightness in the others? So if, if that's taking place, that has to be addressed or the problem is, is probably not going to go away permanently. Well, if you have any questions for either myself or Dr. Browning, uh, feel free to give us a call at the show. The number is 1-888-630-6925, and that's 1-888-630-6925. We're talking about the arm, the shoulder, the the wrists and everything. And essentially, one of the interesting things I too, you know, I see some of these professional players and, and not all of us are going to ever make it into a professional sports career, um, even though some of us hold out for as long as possible. But when you see like a, a football um, game going on and, and basically, you know, I'm always thinking of the people that are really using the arm, like the quarterback. What types of, we talked a little bit about that repetitiveness with injuries and stuff, but what types of things are they doing basically to make sure that they're preventing some of those repetitive injuries from happening? Well, you could be rest assured that the majority of these professional athletes have a huge amount of people working with them on an ongoing basis. Everything from the the, the team general practitioner to the orthopedist to a lot of the guys behind the scenes and in the trenches, the chiropractors, the massage therapists, the acupuncturists, the nutritionists. Their their livelihood is their ability to stay on the field and, and their their ability to play is going to be predicated off of how well they take care of themselves at home. So uh, y- you want to do as much as you can to make sure that the body is stable, certainly it moves as well as it can. And you want to make sure that the nutrition is good. So don't forget, a lot of people have chronic uh, inflammatory processes that are in place, like a tennis elbow that just won't go away because their diet is not very good. And maybe they're just they're, they're dehydrated chronically. So a person needs to look at some of the less obvious things, like what they're eating, even though the problem may be what seems to, to be a just a, a normal ache and pain. So definitely diet. So prevention is, is the key for most folks. But unfortunately, because it's time-consuming and we don't think about it, it doesn't get done that much. Well, I know a lot of people, if they're, you know, they consider themselves on a clean diet, they may or may not be getting enough water and also not only just to keep their normal body functioning, but actually to help flush out some of those toxins and inflammation that might be building, especially if it is a, a common overused area, you know, if there's 
um, you know, especially even just after a normal workout, you know, to flush out some of the extra toxins, toxins and lactic acid that's in there. But when we talk also about people come in a lot of times and they're on a bunch of different supplements and they're on their glucosamine chondroitins and um, they're taking L-glutamine for muscle support and also maybe digestive support. Do you see certain ones that keep popping up over and over that people are getting the wrong idea that they think it's a a cure-all, basically? Well, I don't know if it's so much that it's a wrong idea. I think the the number one problem I see, certainly as working as a clinical nutritionist, as as an aside to being a chiropractor, is the quality of the supplement they're taking is usually very poor. And most people think that all supplements are created equal, and unfortunately that's not the case. So if you're taking a glucosamine, you want to make sure it's the sulfate form and not the HCL form. Um, there's just a, a, a variability across the board as far as manufacturing and the quality of it. So that's that's the one thing I usually see. People bring in their vitamins they got at Costco, and um, they're just not great quality, so they don't get a good effect from it. So they just assume that it's, it's not going to work. Well, it's not going to work in this case, but very often if you change them onto something uh, that has, uh, you know, just a, a good product, they're going to feel better, but that's you know that's a, that's a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and that certainly goes back to how they're able to even digest it too. And going back to how the gut is completely, you know, it would seem like it's unrelated to things going on in the shoulder, but it certainly could be. Certainly absorption. Um, we can take a quick call real quick from Al. How are you doing, Al? Pretty good. Uh, I'm calling in reference to uh, pain in the shoulder uh, due to uh, exercise while doing uh, bench presses. I get this uh, pain in my uh, shoulder, in the front of the shoulder. And uh, over the years, I've had this, but I've always worked through it, and it's gone away. But this time, it's just nagging on and on. All right, Al, we're going to get back to that in just a second. We're going to take a quick break here, and then we're going to answer your question, and we're going to talk more with Dr. Harlan Browning about different types of shoulder and arm pain. We'll be back in just a moment. If you're looking for the best in natural health, wellness, and green living products, shop the Roselle Web Store on Amazon.com. You'll find a variety of products and resources that are designed to help achieve an ultimate state of health and wellness. Shop the Roselle Web Store on Amazon.com today. Visit DrTomRoselle.com and click on Roselle Web Store. That's DrTomRoselle.com and click on Roselle Web Store. Breast cancer is a major health risk to all women. It can silently grow uninterrupted for years. Hi, this is Dr. Tom Rosell, host of Dr. Tom Rosell Live, reminding all women to conduct monthly and annual breast exams. Also consider a thermography scan from the thermography centers as an adjunct to your routine breast exams. Thermographic imaging can detect abnormalities years before a mammogram, and it's safe and non-invasive. For more information, call 888-485-7736 or visit thermographycenters.com. We're back, and we were just about ready to answer a question that we got online, or that got called in, basically. And it brought up something good. The person that goes and works out and kind of overdoes it, and you know they're they're feeling their shoulder pain. What's what's some of the best things they can do, Dr. Browning? You know, uh, Al. First of all, you're not alone. The, the bench press exercise causes a lot of people. Uh, issues. Um, th- the reason being is because as we, we lower the bar down towards our chest, it causes our arm to move back almost behind our body, which puts excessive amounts of strain on on the shoulder itself. So the the first thing I would say to do is you know stop doing the the bench press. If you if you really want to do that movement, you could try using dumbbells because then you can hold them a little bit different to take the stress off that that shoulder. If you absolutely have to do it with a straight bar, what I tell um, my, my patients, and I used to be a strength coach, so I used to tell my athletes take a towel fold it up about three or four times put it on your chest so that stops the bar from going down as far but overall bench press can be really tough on your shoulder uh, regardless of, of your conditioning or age all right well hopefully that answers your question um dr brown why don't you tell us a little bit about again what to expect this wednesday night april the 17th at the Roselle center for healing when you're going to kind of discuss common arm and hand pain and, sh- and shoulder pain as far as what people can expect and look forward to? Well, we're going to talk about the, probably uh, about the six or seven most common reasons that we have pain in the arm or, or down into the hand, and, and that could be things rating from the neck itself or something we call thoracic outlet syndrome. We'll talk about certainly tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. 
Uh, we'll talk about carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, we'll talk about what I call mousing elbow, which I think is becoming more and more common. That's the elbow pain that we get when we use a mouse for our computer. We don't see the carpal tunnel like we used to because people don't type as much. It's all point and click, so we see more elbow problems. And we'll talk about just degenerative joint disease. In other words, just the joint is becoming arthritic over time. We'll look at uh, the causes behind it. We'll look at the anatomy and neurology involved. And we'll certainly talk about things that we can do to fix it. And more importantly, what can we do to make sure it doesn't come back again? Is that similar to you know some of these more modern interpretations, I guess, uh, I heard blackberry thumb. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it's just a, a term I use just because I see a lot of folks getting uh, elbow problems now, not so much in the wrist because uh, of the ease of using the mouse as opposed to, to typing. So, But you know what? It, it, it's just a, it's a different different twist on what we already know as far as the, the problems that we get in the, in the elbow. Very good. Well, if you are interested in listening to this excellent lecture, like I said, you want to call our office at the Rizal Center for Healing, 703-698-7117, and to reserve your spot, it's going to start at 7.30 p.m., and Dr. Browning is going to go through all those great stuff, answer any questions, especially anyone who basically couldn't get in, get their question in, or you can also send us an email over at rosellecare.com. Uh, that's R-O-S-E-L-L-E-C-A-R-E.com. And um, basically, we're also going to have someone sitting in for Dr. Rosell again next week. Uh, Dr. Leonard Poe and his wife, Erin Poe, are going to be sitting in talking about core training. So it's going to be interesting how the two tie in together. You know, we talked a lot about overuse injuries, making sure we have proper stuff going on as far as alignment, and also making sure that we can deal with some of the inflammation and have a proper diet. So they're going to be sitting in for that as well. I want to thank everybody for, for bearing with us. We're not Dr. Rosell, but I think we did a darn good job. I think job. we did a, a very good job. He'll be proud. And, and for those who didn't get the opportunity to see or hear the whole thing, it'll be online in, on our website in a couple weeks. Absolutely, yeah. The I think it's the last month's worth um, actually comes up. And then also you can uh, go online and see some of the previously recorded lectures for a small fee as well, too. So some of Dr. Harlan Brownin's and some of mine as well. So I want to thank everybody for calling. Tune in again next week at noon, and we'll see you and be healthy and well. Are you dental phobic? Do you neglect your dental health because of fear and anxiety? A beautiful smile begins with exceptional dental care, and you can trust in the expertise of Soft Touch Dental Care and Dr. Michael Chung. Soft Touch Dental Care is unlike any dentist office you'll ever experience. Their warm and welcoming environment is designed to soothe fears and anxiety the moment you arrive, and they're especially pleased to pamper their honored guest patients. Dr. Michael Chung is a professional and leading expert in all areas of comprehensive dentistry, including cosmetic, sedation, neuromuscular, TMJ, and implant dentistry. Offering state-of-the-art technology, Dr. Chung can give you the smile of your dreams. Arrange for a complimentary consultation today with Dr. Michael Chung and experience the expertise that makes Dr. Michael Chung so unique. Call 703-319-6990. That's 703-319-6990. Or visit bestinsmile.com. Com. That's bestinsmile.com. Thank you.